Greetings and welcome to our cyber worship with Antioch Baptist Church. For Antioch, this is a season of new transition as we go into another season of our 127 year legacy. We're so thankful and grateful to God for seeing fit to provide us with an under shepherd in the leadership of our pastor emeritus, Reverend Dr. Marvin A. Metmickle, who will serve as our interim pastor. During the season of social distancing, the church doors may be closed, but the real church continues to thrive and we're still praising, praying, giving testimony, service, and worshiping as we worship God with our very lives day to day. Thank you for joining us for this worship experience and it is our prayer that you will be uplifted, encouraged, and we thank you for spending your time with us today. Now we will hear a prophetic word from the Lord, and we pray that you will be blessed.
Well, good morning again to all of you. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I am Marvin McMickle, serving as the interim pastor at Antioch Baptist Church, and it is on behalf of that church and that congregation that I welcome you to this morning's service of worship. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for carving out a little time to be with us by means of this virtual worship service experience. We're glad that you are a part of this family of faith for this period of time. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know from how many different places you are tuning in so that we can be sure that our broadcast is having a sufficient outreach. So uh, if you want to share with us about who you are and where you are, you can come right to the website of the church, AntiochCleveland.org, and just let us know that you are out there and that you are enjoying these services. This won't last forever. Sooner or later, COVID-19 will allow us to resume some normalcy of life and some public gatherings. Even then, we're not sure about how to do that, how to space ourselves and how to clean up the church and whether or not, uh, you know, it's going to be safe for our older and more vulnerable persons. But uh, until we can be sure of all of that, we're going to be doing just this way. And I'm so glad that you are with us. So good morning and welcome to all of you on this glorious Lord's Day. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the wonderful privilege that is ours of gathering together in this format. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to step aside from the busyness of life, and as the word Sabbath would suggest, to simply rest in your presence for a period of time and to remind ourselves, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So speak to us today during this service of worship. Speak by the word that is preached, by the prayers that are offered, by the songs that are lifted, by every form of expression that will take place during this broadcast. May your name be praised and may your people be empowered. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
want to share with you four portions of Scripture. Two of them come from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Two more of them will come from the book of Acts. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. This is the Sunday when Christians all around the world remind themselves of the day when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem and transformed them into persons of great power and enthusiasm for the spreading of the gospel. And so these four verses uh, lead us up to that occasion on the day of Pentecost. The first two are from Jesus telling them that the Holy Spirit would come, uh, and then the other two talk about what happens when the Spirit does arrive. So John chapter 14, uh, reading first of all verses 15 through 17, and then 25 through 27. I'm reading from the New International Version. The words will also appear at the bottom of the screen. Whatever version you might be using, please just allow these words to guide us for this morning. John 14, verses 15 through 17, the first passage says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Some virgins might say another comforter to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And then John 14, verses 25 to 27, the second passage in this chapter, Jesus speaking to the disciples. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So those are the first two portions of scripture for today, uh, the words of Jesus in John 14. There's a third word from Jesus to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, reading verses 6 through 8. So now three times Jesus is telling the disciples to wait for, anticipate the coming of the Spirit. Here's the third one, Acts 1, 6 through 8. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then in Acts chapter 2, the actual event of Pentecost takes place. So three times Jesus says, it is going to come, wait for it to come, don't act until it comes, don't rely on your own power, let the power of God fall upon you. And then finally in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost finally arrives. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now, there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? serving as pastor of Antioch Baptist Church, oh, uh, perhaps around 2005, 2006, somewhere around there. A phone message came to our house 
And this is what the message said. It said, Pastor, the church has no power. The voice was uh, excited. It was animated. It was, it, it was nearly nervous. Pastor, the church has no power. I listened a little longer, and I finally figured out what the message meant. There had been a power failure in the electrical grid in the Fairfax area of Cleveland. All the power in the churches, the businesses, the homes connected to that particular electrical grid had gone out. And indeed, because we were tied to that grid, the church had no power. The lights weren't coming on. The air conditioning was not functioning. The office machinery was not working. The church had no power. The telephones were working because at least at that time, the telephone lines were not tied to any electrical current, but the answering machines were, and therefore even when the phone rang, the machines did not work because they had no power. I've been haunted for years by that telephone message. Pastor, the church has no power. It seems to me that on this Pentecost Sunday, this is a good time to remind ourselves that unless we make the presence of the Holy Spirit a part of our spiritual reservoir, unless we are leaning on and depending on and trusting in that third part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, unless we have all three of those, but on today, especially the power of the Holy Spirit, we might not be operating at full capacity. Friends, it takes more than a great choir or a good preacher or creative programming to have a solid church. It takes more than a spacious sanctuary or large and ample parking facilities. It takes more than a website or a radio or television or an internet broadcast to have an effective church. All of those things are wonderful. If you have all those things working for you, so much the better. But if you do not have consciously in your mind an awareness of the role of the Holy Spirit in the life and work of the church, then your church, my church, every church will simply have no power. And so on today, on this Pentecost Sunday, on this Sunday when we remind ourselves of when the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon that first group of Christians, I want to say to you and to myself, I sure hope that I have the power that is needed to serve God in this present age. Well, what does this power look like in operation? Well, let's look at two people. Consider, first of all, the apostle Peter, and then consider the apostle Paul. Peter, before Pentecost, was haunted by the memory that when push came to shove on three separate occasions, he did just what Jesus predicted he would do and said not once, not twice, but three times, I don't know him. I never knew him. I am not one of his followers. When Jesus was on his way to the trial, which led to the suffering, which led to the cross, all that Peter could remember him doing about it was saying, I never knew him. And that all the disciples, except for Judas, who'd already killed himself, all the rest of them were hiding in the upper room, afraid that if they showed their face in public and dared to speak the name of Jesus publicly, that what happened to Jesus might happen to them. If they crucified Jesus, they too might be crucified. And so behind locked doors and shuttered windows, there they sat trembling for fear of what might happen to them, afraid of every approaching footstep, afraid of every voice as it passed by where they were sitting together, frightened, trembling men before Pentecost. But when Pentecost came, 
when the Holy Spirit broke through those shuttered doors and manifested itself with tongues of fire that rested over each of their heads, a wonderful transformation took place in all of them, but especially in Peter. Peter, who three times had said, I do not know who Jesus is, now goes out into the city of Jerusalem, facing the very same people that moments ago he was hiding from, afraid to confront, and declares to them, this Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Savior and Lord. And on the day that he does that preaching, 3,000 souls are added to the church. What happened to Peter? What transformed him from a, a man who first denied knowing Jesus, and then 50 days later is declaring to the whole world, this Jesus is Lord. What happened to Peter was Pentecost. Now, Pentecost, even though it started in the upper room, unleashed the power of the Holy Spirit that carried forward all the way through the book of the Acts. You could just as easily call the book of the Acts of the Apostles the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because in place after place, time after time, day after day, year after year, it's the Holy Spirit that is empowering people to go to work. So now in Acts chapter 7 and 8, we catch up with the Apostle Paul. We first meet him as Saul of Tarsus. Saul, who the Bible says was consenting to the murder of Stephen, who was stoned for preaching about Jesus, and Saul, who took it upon himself to say, I want to have the authority to arrest every Christian that I see and wipe them off the face of the earth. That was Saul's agenda on his way to uh, the city of Damascus. But on the city of Damascus, something happened to Saul. He was knocked down off of his horse. He was put on the ground. He was blinded for a while. He was then given a new revelation that his job was not to persecute the church. His job was to proclaim the gospel in every corner of the world of Asia Minor and Southern Greece. His job was to be the voice and the feet and the heart and the soul of the early church. What happened to Saul? How did he go from persecutor to proclaimer? And the answer is Pentecost. The power of the Spirit, which picked him up, turned him around, and set his feet in a new direction. What happened to Peter? Pentecost picked him up, turned him around, set his feet in a new direction. All the disciples, what happened? Picked them up, turned them around. By Acts 17, the Bible says, these are they who are turning the world upside down. How do you go from hiding in the upper room to turning the world upside down? Something had to happen to you. The answer is Pentecost. Now, some people believe that Pentecost, because of the nature of the word, should only be observed by people who call themselves Pentecostals. Well, let me put it to you this way. Pentecostals have the right to claim Pentecost for themselves to the same degree that Baptists have the right to claim baptism just for themselves. Pentecost is not just for the Church of God in Christ. It's not just for the Pentecostal assemblies of the world. It's not just for Bishop Ellis's church, Pentecostal Churches of Christ. It's not just for the full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship. They emphasize the work of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have a corner on the market of the Holy Spirit. If all of them baptize and they're Pentecostal, then all of us ought to lay claim to the power of the Holy Spirit, even if we are Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or Lutherans or Roman Catholics or Independents. You cannot be a Christian if you do not embrace the notion 
that God functions in three ways. God, who is the creator of everything, is the first part of the Trinity. God who made the heavens and the earth. God who breathed life into Adam from the dust of the earth. God who spun out into all of creation, sun and moon and stars. God who put speed in the wings of eagles and fragrances in the petals of roses. God the creator. To know God in the power of creation is part of what it means to be a Christian. That's the first part of the Trinity. The second part of the Trinity is to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. If God gave us commandments to live by, if God gave us ethical standards to live up to, and we have failed to do so, and we deserve God's judgment and God's wrath, then think about what happens when Jesus steps in and takes upon himself on the cross the sins of the whole world. Think about the wonderful word atonement. And let's break that word up. Atonement. Act one meant. What Jesus does on the cross is he puts us back together with God. We are at one. We were separated by sin. He dies on the cross. God accepts his death as a payment for the penalty for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for all of us that we might have the right to life. You've got to have God the creator. You've got to have God the Redeemer, God the Savior, in the person of Jesus Christ. But Jesus says you need something else. Now listen, if he hadn't said it, I wouldn't bother you with it. If the Lord didn't bring it up, I wouldn't bring it up right now because I don't understand all these mysteries. But I can't let this go. I, I can't let the Holy Spirit go because three times, not once, not twice, three times, Jesus says to his disciples, wait for the Spirit when I go, I will send you a comforter. I will send you a counselor. Do not do anything until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will need the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, then you can go to work for me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Pentecost. The word actually means 50 days or the 50th day. Pentecost began as an agricultural celebration for the ancient Jewish community. And it was 50 days after Passover. 50 days after Passover, they would come back to Jerusalem to celebrate the first fruits of their agricultural cycle. They would come in to thank God and praise God for whatever the crops had yielded that year. It was a agricultural festival, 50 days after Passover. That's why uh, in Acts chapter 2 it says there were, there were God-fearing Jews from all over the world who were in Jerusalem on that day. They had come from everywhere, from every corner of the known world to celebrate the, the observation, uh, the observance of Pentecost, to thank God for their abundance for their produce, for, for their yield, for their crop. And on that day, just like Jesus transformed uh, Passover from a celebration about coming out of slavery in Egypt to his own body, his own blood, in the same way, Pentecost transforms an agricultural celebration, thanking God for your crops, and now it becomes a celebration of the souls that are being added to the church. In one day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people come to Jesus from every known part of the world. And here's the wonderment of it all. Most of them did not speak the same language, but they all heard what Peter was saying in their own native tongue. The Bible tells us where they came from. They came from as places as far away as Rome and Egypt and Libya, all over Asia Minor. They came from Cappadocia. They came from Phrygia. 
if you look at the churches in the book of Revelation, they came from Laodicea, Thyatira, Pergamum, Smyrna, Philadelphia. They came from everywhere. They spoke different languages, but they all heard the same message, not in the same language, but in their own language, because Pentecost also was the undoing of what happened at the Tower of Babel, when God confused the languages so people could not understand one another. Pentecost canceled that and made it possible for everybody, no matter who they were or where they were from, to hear the gospel in their own language. That's the power of Pentecost. And that's our mission, is to keep that power alive and to keep that work alive of spreading the gospel to places of different cultures, different languages, different parts of the world, our job is to make sure that everybody on earth has a chance to hear the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest, that ever was heard. That's part of Pentecost. That's the traditional part of Pentecost. There's one more side to Pentecost that I want to lift up. I want to go back to Peter and Paul. I want to go back to Acts chapter 4. I want to go back to Peter and John being taken into prison. Guilty under the power of the Holy Spirit of preaching about Jesus. Now follow this sequence. Peter and John in Jerusalem are arrested for boldly preaching about Jesus. They are thrown into the prison. The Sanhedrin, the leaders, the political and the religious leaders of the city say to them, we will let you out of jail only on one condition. That condition is that you no longer speak about Jesus. What is the first thing they do when they get out of jail? They go right back to the city. They go right back to the street. They go right back to where they were. They go right back to preaching Jesus Christ is Lord. Once again, they are arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin looks at them and scratches their heads. And this is what Acts 4 says. They try to figure out how common men with no formal training could speak the way they do. And they use this word boldness or courage. But the Greek word behind that, boldness or courage, the Greek word is parhesia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. -R -R -E they spoke with boldness. They spoke with courage. They spoke with parhesia. Peter and John, spoke with Parhesia. Later, Paul is arrested. He is taken to trial before almost the ultimate authorities in his world. Uh, the Jewish governor of uh, the Jewish king of Galilee, whose name was Agrippa, and the, Jew and the Roman governor, whose name was Festus. So here is Paul, who, by the way, uh, had started out trying to erase the name of Jesus from all living memory. He's now on trial before King Agrippa and Festus, Roman governor. And what does Paul do? He starts to preach to them about Jesus and says to Agrippa, you know, you are not far from being a believer. I think you really want to confess your faith in Christ. Maybe if you confess your faith in Christ, you might feel better in the long run. And the king says, Paul, you must have lost your mind. Your much learning has made you mad. Did you think that in such a short period of time, you could convert me to believing in Jesus? And Paul said, with a short time or a long time, that's my goal is to convert you and that Roman governor over there to followers of Jesus. Now, what gave Paul on trial for his life? The power, the enthusiasm, the conviction at his own trial 
not to plead guilty or innocent, just to preach the gospel and invite his accusers to accept faith in Christ. It's the same word. It's parhesia. It's boldness of speech. It's courage in the face of whatever conditions you are under that allow you to say what God has given you to say, whether folks want to hear it or not. There's another level to parhesia, friends. In the Greek language, parhesia doesn't just mean boldness or courage. It means boldness of speech without regard for the consequences to the speaker. In other words, you aren't going to bite your tongue because somebody might not like what you say. You aren't going to give a half-truth because the whole truth might be unpopular. You aren't going to cut corners or, or make it easy on somebody. You're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, whether those who hear you, like you, agree with you, support you, encourage you, or not. Parkesia. Bold speech, whether the world wants to hear it or not. When Socrates, the Greek philosopher of the fourth century, was about to be put to death, made to drink a kind of poison called hemlock, he gave a speech, kind of the last words. He said, I know why you want me dead. You want me dead because you cannot stand my parhesia. You can't, you can't accept my bold speech. I, I have not bitten my tongue. I have not told you that, that right is wrong and wrong is right. I have not told you that what you do is always glorious. I have not lied to you. I haven't given you a steady dose of fake news. I have told you only what is true, and you just didn't want to hear it. So since you can't listen to me, you just as soon have me dead. You can't stand me because of my parhesia. Oh, for church and for pulpits and pews overflowing with parhesia. We have so much misinformation coming at us day in and day out. We have so many misleading things going on around us. It really wouldn't hurt us if we could get a steady dose of truth coming from the church of Jesus Christ. We need some plain speaking, truth telling parhesia about the world in which we live. What's wrong with this country? How can a man be jogging down the street in Brunswick, Georgia, stopped by two people with no authority, end up shot to death with a shotgun, and three months go by before the people who shot him are even arrested, and they may not be tried for God knows how long? How can a woman who is one of our frontline workers be in her own bed and police come in on her because they thought that she was somebody else and shot her in her bed. And when someone with her with a permit to carry the gun fires back because no one said we are the police, no one showed a badge, he thought they were being robbed. So he's firing in self-defense, and the next thing you know, the policemen are free, and he is arrested for assaulting a policeman who never said he was a policeman. What do you say about a country like that? What do you say about Minneapolis? What do you say about a 46-year-old man who is, who is arrested? Handcuffed, on the ground, no picture of him resisting arrest anywhere. But a police officer with 18 separate instances of civilian complaints against him puts his knee on the neck of a man who is down for over seven minutes. The man says, I cannot breathe. 
Echoes of Eric Gardner in Staten Island, New York. Echoes of how many instances, known to us and unknown to us, of people who have died already in police custody. He wasn't running away. He wasn't fighting back. He didn't have a weapon. He had committed no violent crime. I'm not saying that what he did was right or wrong. I'm not quite sure of what he did. The word they used was forgery. Then I heard about passing a bad $20 bill. I don't know what he was doing. All I know is nothing I heard of should result in a death penalty. And after seven minutes, with blood coming out of his nose and breath escaping from his body, they finally get up off of him and he dies within minutes. And they lied and said he was resisting arrest. And then they were fired. Well, I'm glad they were fired. I'm not worrying about them being fired. I want to know when they're going to be arrested and charged with the murder, first degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter, unintentional death. I don't know what the law says. I just know that if I had put my knee on somebody's neck, even if I had the right to do it and they died, I wouldn't be going home that night. What do you say about that? How can we have church on Sunday and talk about stewardship, building funds, talk about the need for a new sanctuary? How, how do we have business as usual when all of these things are going on in our world, we, we need to have some bold speech. But don't do it by ourselves. The reason why we don't do it is because we don't have parhesia. We may have a master's degree in divinity, but we don't have parhesia. We may have 35 years of experience as administrators, but we don't have enough parhesia to give us something to say in the critical hour. And it's not just the people in the pulpit who need to have parhesia. Every believer needs to be able to say a bold word at a critical time about what's happening in the world around us. And that's what Pentecost is about. It fell on the church. Didn't just fall on one or two people. It fell on the church. Three thousand people were converted on that day. So on this Pentecost Sunday, I want to simply invite you to ask yourself whether or not you have received into your heart, into your life, into your consciousness, all that God has to offer. Yes, we need God the Creator. I'm glad that God creates. I mean, and with such wondrous beauty, such rich variety. I, I, I watch spring uh, slowly give way to summer. I watch flowers blossom. I watch birds feeding through the sky. God's creation is wonderful. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God's creation is wonderful. We need the first part of the Trinity. Jesus is a great savior. Ask yourself, as I remind myself, what it was that Jesus had to look beyond in order to save us. There's no need in my pretending that I was always a preacher, that I was always a churchgoer, that I was always on the Lord's side. And no need in acting as if uh, in earlier parts of my life I was living in a different lane of traffic and moving in a different direction. There's nothing about my early life that justifies my present occupation. Nothing. All I can say is he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. Jesus is a great Savior. Isn't he? Hadn't he saved you from something of which you might still be ashamed? We can't turn around and, and give somebody else a high five. So smack your own hand and remind yourself of what a wonderful change in your life has been wrought 
since Jesus came into your heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, like a sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I, I need a great Savior. But I need more. Because Jesus says, I'm going to leave you. But I won't leave you alone. I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you a counselor. I'm going to send you a teacher. I'm going to send you a guide. I'm going to send you a source of power. I'm going to send you an energizer. And don't leave home without it. Never mind the American Express card. The American Express card is not accepted everywhere. You can't take it everywhere. But the Holy Spirit is everywhere. It can empower you everywhere. It can surround you everywhere. It can protect you everywhere. It can direct you everywhere. It can give you boldness of speech everywhere. You don't have to pick the when and the where to be a bold speaking Christian. Just let the Lord give you the words to speak and speak them everywhere. When I first came to town, I was taken out to a lunch by a pastor in town I will not name. We went to a restaurant that was on the 30th floor of Erie View Towers. I think the restaurant is now long since closed. It was a great view of the city, so he was going to, you know, let me see Cleveland from that elevation. It was wonderful. We ordered our lunch. We chatted for a while about various matters, and then lunch came, and he promptly picked up his knife and fork and started to eat. I uh, said to him, Reverend, shouldn't somebody say something about uh, the food we did not prepare, the bread we did not grow, the meat that we did not harvest, the salad we didn't pick, the tomatoes that we did not gather up. Shouldn't somebody give some thanks to God for this bounty? And he said to me, well, Reverend, you say it. I don't want to say it because people might see me praying. I don't want to call attention to myself praying. I said, Reverend, I thought that was the point. I thought the whole point was that we take Jesus everywhere so that wherever we are, people do see us praying and do see us testifying and do see us walking the line and do see us standing up for justice and do see us speaking out the words of truth. I thought that was the point. And if you've got the Holy Spirit and if you've got a little parhesia in you, then you can be bold and you can be faithful and you can stand up for Jesus anywhere you are. But you can't do it by yourself. You need the third part of the Trinity. You need God, the Holy Spirit. So on this Pentecost Sunday, I just want to end with these words. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me and melt me, and mold me, and fill me, and use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me and on all of you. Have a wonderful Pentecost Sunday. There's Amen. a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the
Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for A doubt will know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dawn, stay right here. doors of our church and to invite you into fellowship with Antioch Baptist Church. I want to invite you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Perhaps you are listening from a location that is remote from Cleveland and you can't come to Cleveland every Sunday. Uh, if that is you and you're living someplace far removed, that even if you can't join Antioch, I want to encourage you in your faith. I want to stir up uh, as Paul said about Timothy, stir up the faith that is in you. Find a church home, be active in the ministry of your church. But most of all, receive into yourself the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a telephone number, there's an email address that comes on the bottom of the screen. I hope that you will call that number or link up with that email address and express to this church, your interest in either knowing more about us or helping us help you learn more about spiritual resources in the places where you live. But right now, in these sacred moments, I hope and I pray that you make a decision to walk with the Lord, God the Father, God the Son, God.
our service to an end, I want to thank you for sharing with us on this Lord's Day just a couple of announcements, reminders. Uh, I'm going to start a Bible class that will start uh, on the first Friday of June. It's going to be a Zoom class, so you can Zoom in from wherever you are and be a part of that. Uh, we'll make available to you the Zoom connection, and uh, the church website will have that. If you go to www.antiochcleveland.org, you'll find the way to link in to the Bible class. Friday mornings from 10 to 11, I would love to have you as a part of that Bible class opportunity. Now, beginning in the month of June, I'm going to be on a somewhat different schedule. I preached every Sunday in May up through the fifth Sunday. But from June until the end of the year, I'll be on a two-Sunday-a-month schedule. So I'll be preaching on the first Sunday of each month and the fourth Sunday of each month. In the intervening weeks, other ministers, other persons will be preaching for various occasions, Father's Day, Women's Day, whatever the case might be. So uh, beginning on the first Sunday in June, I'll be on that two Sunday a month schedule. First Sunday, fourth Sunday, other preachers in between. Whoever's preaching, the word is going to be good. The fellowship is going to be rich. The music is going to be rewarding. So I hope you'll tune in every Sunday. Whoever the preacher is or isn't, the Lord is with us. And we ought to be with the Lord. Grace unto you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. God keep you until we meet again. Bye-bye. We're so glad that you were able to join us virtually for Sunday morning worship. At Antioch, we'd like for you to know that Sunday worship is but one part of our ministry here. There are various ministries that attend to the needs of our community, and you can participate with us. You can do so by supporting our ministries through prayer, as well as through your financial stewardship. You may give through the app Givelify, as well as on our website for PayPal. You may also mail in any contribution to Antioch Baptist Church 8869 Cedar Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio, 44106. We thank you for participating with us in the upbuilding of God's kingdom. God bless you.